My name is Mark Lamont Hill, and I am excited to be here because we have really an amazing, amazing book talk coming today. Not because I'm here, uh, but because Jason Stanley is here. This book, uh, How Fascism Works, is incredibly engaging and smart and accessible uh, and advances an argument at a moment where we need it the most. Um, and I couldn't be happier that he's here and Uncle Bobby's with us, and I couldn't be happier uh, that you all are here. So we're going to get started. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. Oh, well, it's an honor to be here. I'm a huge fan of yours oh, and what, you, you. what you've done and what you represent. But not just what you represent, who you are. Oh, well, <laughs> thank uh, you. So, uh, so I wouldn't, uh, thank you for inviting me. I wouldn't miss this. This is a treasure, this place. Uh, and Mark Lamont Hill. It, this book is a treasure. Let me ask you a question. I was thinking this as I was reading it. You're a philosopher. Why philosophy on fascism? <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Well, I mean, why, why would you wade into these waters? Yeah. So uh, I think that's more of a depressing comment on what has happened to my discipline <laughs> than, than these fair, waters. Fair, <laughs> that's a fair point. Uh, I mean, uh, Angela Davis is a philosopher. Uh, yeah. Marcuse, if you think about the middle of the 20th century, if you think about the last 50 years, who's been responding to these elements in our society? It's been the philosophers. I mean, yeah. uh, the, the, the Frankfurt School is philosophers. Yeah. So you had, you had philosophers responding to fascism. Arendt was a philosopher. Now, you can't do philosophy in a detached way, detached from if you're going to do philosophy that speaks to who we are and uh, that then you need to do philosophy together with social theory. You need to do philosophy together with an understanding. Uh, if you're going to talk about the human condition, you know, you yeah. can't do it without some understanding of humans. Right. And so you need history. Philosophy needs to be informed by history. Uh, needs to be informed. I mean, I, th I think what happened to the discipline of philosophy is anthropologists, sociologists, histor historians took things from it. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then it left this thing that was sort of like a too little professionalized. Bit, too, too professionalized and a little bit of a desiccated husk. Mm. And so it needs to be, so what you find in, in, in the works of, uh, I mean, uh, you, you also find, you also find, I mean, I've learned a lot, Christy Dotson, the philosopher Christy Dotson, uh, talks of black feminist philosophy as a philosophy of, uh, of service. And what she means from that, by that is you start with the concrete problems mm -hmm. and then you use the concrete problems to philosophize. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, injustice is puzzling. Like, why is there injustice? That's right. philosophically puzzling. And you start from concrete instances of, 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 of injustice and then you go outwards in order to, to think, how could that have happened? And so, uh, so that's a different way than sort of starting from on top. Right. And then looking at the world to see, to see uh, you know, what fits your theory, uh, if you look to the world at all. Um, and I think this is what you find with someone like Angela Davis, like when, when, when she starts with like, she starts the concrete problem and like how prisons are obsolete. Uh, uh, prison abolition. How do you get people to think of a world without prisons? Right. That's really tricky. And right. then she uses, you know, she's like, well, you have to take a question like, she said, you have to respond to the question, what replaces the prison? And she's right. like, you have to re-describe the world so the question doesn't make sense. Right, you know? exactly. And so that's a point in philosophy of language. It's a point in, you know, as a philosopher, I can see, you know, the moves she's making there. Like, uh, what replaces the prison has a presupposition. The presupposition is something must replace the prison. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, you yeah. have to defeat that presupposition. How do you defeat a presupposition? These are things philosophers have been discussing for 100, 150 years. I'm going to ask a question about this book. But I just have one more question about philosophy in relation to this book. Is, because there are so many philosophers who would say, no, that's not our job. Right. Our job, some would say our job is not to make normative claims about the world, unless we're in a very... Ethics, right, right, unless we're doing... Right. There's, there's some people whose job that is, but the philosophy as such right. should not be doing that. We should be doing things like understanding the relationship parts the whole. We should be trying to solve certain kinds of eternal problems. Right. You know, um, but, but abstract problems, not, not the public and its problems. <laughs> Dewey, it's a little Dewey nerdy Dewey thing that. there, but yeah. yeah. Uh, right. So... Uh, I would, uh, uh, you know, we're continuing the discussion we've had since the second we met. Uh, the uh, the uh, Plato's Republic um, is a response to a figure of Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus 
says, there's just power. Uh, you know, virtue is a weakness. Justice is a weakness. Uh, it's just the powerful rule and everyone else obeys. And virtue is just for the weak. Uh, and all of the Republic is a reply to Thrasymachus. Mm -hmm. uh, and if Plato's Republic is not philosophy, I'm not really sure what is philosophy. <laughs> so, and Thrasymachus, what is Thrasymachus saying? Thrasymachus is defending fascism. Right. Thrasymachus is defending the view that all there is is power. And what is Plato saying in response to Thrasymachus? Plato is saying, we need to, to value truth because truth is the antidote to power. Yeah. And so that is the basis of philosophy. If Plato's Republic is the basis of Western philosophy, then replying to fascism is the basis of what we do as philosophers. And that's why you love Dewey, right. Mark. Right. <laughs> that's, that's what Dewey's doing. How do you set up a society that responds to injustice, that, that, that responds to, to Lippmann's challenge of it just being you know, mere empty symbols manipulate, manipulated by the powerful to get the masses to do what you want. Wow. So that takes us right to this book at this moment in history. At this moment in history. Why now? It's probably an easy question. Yeah, right, yeah why? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> right. well, well, why now? Uh, I'm going flip to flip, flip that question back at you, Mark. Because yesterday I spoke at R.J. Julia, book, Julia Bookstore in Middletown, Connecticut, the Wesleyan Bookstore. I was affiliated with Wesleyan. Lori Grun, who helped found the Wesleyan, uh, the Wesleyan prison program, uh, asked me the following question. She, she, uh, she, she said, why not 15 years ago? Right, <laughs> right. That's actually why I was asking that. Right. Because, because there's this way, um, and I don't want to jump ahead because I want you all to follow this conversation, um, and not the one we partly had in the bookstore, right? <laughs> um, that you describe the sort of what fascism is, some of the basic principles, and how we're in a moment that is kind of satisfying the conditions for that, right? Right. <laughs> Let's start there, actually, and then, I, then I'll ask the, the next okay. question. W w first, help us understand what fascism is. Okay, so then, and then I want to get back to Lori, yes. to Lori Groon's question. So Lori Groon asked me, why can we talk about fascism now, and why when so many of the things you described That's exactly why I'm wondering. were alive 15 years ago, were you considered uh, untethered from reality if you talked about fascism Precisely. then? Precisely. I just, I, just, I just want everyone to have a, a working functional understanding of what fascism is who haven't right. had a chance to read this book yet. So, 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 uh, you know, so to one more thing about Lori Grun, which will get me into the book. Um, she said, you know, she was the editor in chief of Hypatia, the, the feminist philosophy uh, journal. And she said, you know, 15 years ago, if you talked about pa uh, patriarchy being fascist, then people would have just regarded you as just mad. Uh, untethered, from, I'm trying to be less ableist, untethered from reality. Um, and oh, they probably just would have regarded you as mad, actually. Um, and if you talked about the prison system, if you talked about race and mass incarceration, if you talked about super predator theory in the 1990s as, as fake news, the entire 1990s was fake news, right? Mm. I mean, crime starts dropping in 1991, violent crime starts dropping in 1991, and drops precipitously until 2000. And John Delio, I don't know if he's here, but uh, <laughs> yeah, John Delio gets tenure at Princeton by promoting the view that there's a group of super predators that are, uh, you know, uh, that can kill, rape, rape, and maim without feeling any remorse. Never explaining why they would do it in the first place. Right. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, and that by the year 2000, by 2010, the cities of America will be red with blood. You know, so the fake news was, so the different elements of fascism, the outgroup, the vilification of outgroups, um, you know, the, the fake news directed at outgroups, patriarchy, uh, uh, strongman politics, the, the, uh, the br br since I'm with Mark Lamont Hill, the bringing, bringing them to heel. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, uh, the comment by Clinton about super pre the fictional super predators. We had all this. We had all these elements there in the 1990s. Um, so, uh, but they were only directed against African Americans. And so, uh, 
So white people, most many white people were fine. They were like, hey, fascism is not directed against us, so we're good. But it's inevitable if you allow fascism to be, if you allow those tactics, if you allow there to be a steady stream of fake news that represents an outgroup in a certain way, in the way Jews were represented in Europe during fascism, living in the cities. <laughs> um, uh, this is my chapter, Sodom and Gomorrah. The cities are always filled with the hated members of the outgroup. Chapter two of Mein Kampf is called My Time in Vienna. And he says, uh, in, uh, I go to Vienna and there's foreigners and Jews, Jews and more Jews. The cities are the place where there are Jews and homosexuals. And hey, what does the expression inner city mean in the United States? Uh, you know, the outgroup lives in the cities. Uh, so so we, tolerated, we tolerated a structure here for a long period of time. Um, you know, a prison system built up from like 275,000 prisoners to 2.3 million. 9% uh, of the world's prison population is African American, which I think must be the only time uh, other than the Holocaust that one small group has been that percentage of the prison population. So we had all these elements, um, but, but you didn't have people just aiming fake news at everyone. <laughs> Um, so, but now, so it's kind of a situation like Césaire describes in Discourse on Colonialism, where he has this passage about the Nazis, and he's like, oh, the prisons are filled to overflowing. There's a knock on the door. It's the Gestapo. The concentration camps are full. Oh, don't worry. It's just the Nazis. They'll be gone soon. And he said, ah, you know, everyone is surprised. Um, but... The Nazis are just what all of, us, all of you Europeans were doing to Africa for decades. <laughs> so, of course, it's going to come back. And that's what happened here, I think. That, you know, we, have, we got used to uh, a fascist base structure. Uh, we got used to uh, fake news. We got used to vilification of minorities and a certain structure of vilification of minorities that I'm going to discuss. And then, of course, someone is going to come and be like, hey, <laughs> fake yeah. news. Yeah. I can aim that at opponents. <laughs> I can aim that at anyone because you're used to being lied to. So, uh, so let's get to the structure of fascism and then return to this point. Mm -hmm. So I have, so my book is about fascist fascist ideology and propaganda. And fascism, as I've already indicated, has as its core power. And the, the response to fascism is truth, because, you know, the way to deal with power is you speak truth to it. Um, so fascism, uh, so I, I think, and it's also to, resp to play off Marx, interchange with Marx, um, that there are, so there's ten elements I describe, but Many of these elements were familiar before the 20th century fascist movements. You see them in the history of political philosophy. You see them when, when, with Hobbes, when, when Hobbes is trying to say what happens if you don't have a benevolent dictator. You'll have despotism. You'll have tyranny. You'll have, you'll have Thrasymachus in, in, uh, in, in the Republic. Uh, one figure who's just doing everything to enrich himself. Uh, but what you have with the contemporary fascist movement with the 20th century is you have the addition of nationalism to that. And that requires the 19th century. So the 19th century sort of people create nation, people, there's sort of this philosophical overlay uh, of, of like the nation. Uh, um, so, so, uh, so fascism is, is an ideology that's based on power and this, its structure is, uh, so is hierarchical and in, the, in its current form, there's a na members of a chosen nation are at the top of the hierarchy, and everyone else is below. Uh, men are above women. It's harshly patriarchal. Because in fascist politics, you advert to anything that reminds people of hierarchy. Anything that strengthens hierarchy. And, and, and the enemy of fascism is equality. Uh, so... So in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the Jews are responsible for equality, which I'm happy to take credit, but, I, you know. Uh, so uh, so uh, the Jews are responsible for equality, the Jews are responsible for liberty. Um, and, these are, and, and, and these are myths that are used to 
destabilize the power of the dominant group. Um, so the, I, the protocol says, you know, uh, protocols is this, um, uh, well, let me, first, let me first sketch before I get into the protocols. I have a tendency to go quick straight to the protocols. Uh, the, uh, as, as, as my kids tell me. Um, so uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, I mean, there's a very simple way, I think, of explaining fascism, which I use with my three-year-old. I tell him, in fascism, there's one big daddy. Uh, so it's just a, a, a system, a patriarchal system, where the leader is like the father of his nation. So that's why patriarchy is so central to it. Um, so, uh, so it's based on power. So these are tactics to seize and maintain power. So people often ask me, well, does, does, do some of the figures that you discuss in the contemporary era, like, for instance, President Trump, does he really believe this ideology? And my response is, it doesn't matter because fascism is about power. So it just doesn't matter what he believes. He's using these tactics to gain and maintain power. So there is no set of beliefs. It's about using some tactics to gain and maintain power. And the set of beliefs is winning is good. <laughs> you know, winning creates value and losers have no value. You make a distinction between fascist politics, fascist tactics, um, and a fascist state. You're not asserting that we are in a fascist state. No. That's an important distinction, I think, to make. It's vital because otherwise people will be like, you're totally exaggerating right. and you're... Um, so the, the, this book is about fascist tactics. It's about a set of tactics that people often cynically use, in fact, typically cynically use, to gain power. What they do once they gain power, well, they do different things. Italy looked different than Germany. Uh, but, uh, but you start to see a process. Uh, I mean, it, it's true that fascist tactics wear down institutions once fascist pol people who use these tactics gain power. Because if what you care about is just power and loyalty, then you're going to wear down the institutions by, say, putting your cronies and henchmen, uh, your family members, into the institutions. For example. For example, hypothetically. yeah, hypothetically. Um, so uh, Arendt talks about this. Arendt talks about how um, fascist fascist organizations re re resemble the mafia, the mob, because you know what's the mob based on? What's the mafia based on? Loyalty. <laughs> and what's fascism based on? Loyalty, loyalty to the guy on top. So this is about the tactics. Um, it's not about what happens when you get to the top. Um, Though I think when you get to the top, you find, you know, you find a sort of, you find the tactics wearing down the institutions. But we're result, we're nowhere near the, the point where our institutions have been hollowed out. And, uh, and I think that right now, I mean, right now we have a worldwide fascist movement, like we had in the 20s and 30s, uh, uh, with different leaders working to different degrees. Bolsonaro in Brazil being a very specifically extreme example, um, and uh, and what they've just and, and there are differences between now and the twenties and the thirties and forties because uh, there's a couple differences. I think there's several differences. One difference is uh, fascism. The fascist tactics are being used to enrich people, like which is not a big difference. Like we think of the Nazis. As, as these sort of like devoted anti-Semites who like would do anything to kill Jews. But in fact, most of the Nazis couldn't care less about Jews. They were just, they just wanted Jewish money, Jewish art, Jewish property. So they were in fact just mafia, just stuff. Right. And so, uh, so I think, fat, but fascist tactics now are not being used to invade other countries as much as they're being used to just like throw you know, get people hyped up about an us versus them way of thinking and then take their money. Absolutely. Uh, one, one of the things that comes up in the book um, is a certain kind of nostalgia, yeah. a certain kind of investment in a previous historical moment. The mythic past. The mythic past, yes. Yeah. I was thinking about Stephanie Kunt's work also, The Way We Never Were, this idea that there was this moment. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. Um, so that's chapter one, it's called The Mythic Past. Yes. It's about how every fascist movement involves hearkening back 
to a past that never was. And the structure of the past looks, looks very similar. It's always a past where the members of the chosen nation ruled over others. The Holy Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire for Hitler, which as they say was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire, but be that as it may. Um, the, uh, the Roman Empire for Mussolini. Um, and uh, in Hungary right now, it's the greater Hungary. Uh, Serbia, it was the Serbian, it was, it was it, for Erdogan, it's the Ottomans. Uh, it's oh, for in, in the Hindutva movement in India. It's uh, it's you know supposedly this Hindu past before there were Muslims before there were West was Western influence. Um, it's uh, f for Israel. It's <laughs> uh, so uh, so um, so. There's always this past that never actually was, and and there was the traditional family, and men were men, and and women stayed at home and raised the next generation. It always looks like that. And what's nice, I mean, what's the reason that the the Nazis and Mussolini are such useful examples is they were very explicit about this. Right. Here, in the States, it's more subtle. Right. Right. We want to be great again. <laughs> um, the historical junction at which we were great is a little more ambiguous, although you kind of, you get us to a point, you persuaded me that he's talking about the 1930s. 30s, yeah. Right, I always imagined more like 1830s. Right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but the third 1930s were terrifying. So other than yeah. the New Deal. Right, right, right. But, but I mean, when Trump ran, he was like, we're gonna do an infrastructure project. Remember right. that? Right, 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 right. <laughs> like, like the 1930s. Right, but, but it's also a moment where there's a, a deep sympathy for fascism. Absolutely. It, it was Could be a coincidence, right? Yeah, it was a time, and we were this close to, I mean, Charles Lindbergh, America First. The America First movement, I'm reading that book by uh, Hart, by Bradley Hart, yeah. where he talks about how the America First movement was the, it was, it was, it was sort of, it was winking fascism, but it was the fascist movement. It was everything from Father Coughlin to the, the German-American Bund, uh, and they tried to sort of like pretend they were disassociated from the explicitly Hitler-funded, Nazi-funded movements like the German-American Bund, but they were just the American fascist movement. And America first. <laughs> so it's not that subtle. No, it, it, it's not, but it, it's an interesting thing. It, it, it's a hell of a project to, to get Americans to reimagine, or any, co any collective community, imagined community of, or community of any sort, to imagine a historical moment in a way that runs so counterfactually, uh, what are some of the tactics that 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 a that, that a fascist structure what engages in to make that happen? Well, so first, the point of doing it is you want to connect people's uh, members of the, your supporters' feeling of anxiety uh, about the future to a sense of loss. Yeah. to nostalgia, as you say, to nostalgia for, well, first of all, all these tactics are about displacing truth. Hierarchy, mythic past, victimhood, they're all about getting people used to a politics that is just us versus them, and the truth doesn't matter at all, and there are these nice myths, that there, but there are myths. And so the function of the mythic past is to get people, when they feel anxious, to blame that anxiety and that sense of loss on losing this past when when they were respected for just being them where yeah. men were respected just for being men where whites were respected just for being white yeah so uh so that's the that's its function right you 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 you've talked about patriarchy a few times i want to drill down on that just for a second because it's it's it was surprising to me that that would be a central tenet of fascism. Not that patriarchy, patri I mean, patriarchy kind of cuts through all historical right. moments and it precedes even this economic mode of production. So it doesn't surprise that patriarchy existed, right. but that you saw it as so central to the fascist project. Yeah, I think the, the um, Arendt obscures this in Origins of Totalitarianism because she's talking about both communism and fascism right. together. And my book is about fascism. There are multiple bad things in the world, and like Mao was bad, and Stalin was bad, and they weren't fascist bad. Though I think there were elements <laughs> of fascism. <laughs> but uh, but but you know there there's an egalitarian ethos in authoritarian communist movements. Um, there's no egalitarian ethos in fascism. Yeah. So Arendt, because she's theorizing them together, never mentions patriarchy. 
but in like the authoritarian personality and Adorno and other literature on fascism, people are very clear about the role of patriarchy. The Nazis were the most anti-feminist government of the 20th century. All women lost their jobs. They were just supposed to stay at home and have babies. Abortion, the Reich Ministerium for Abortion and Homosexuality, uh, like uh, abortion were the strongest possible uh, rule, uh, 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 penalties for performing an abortion on an Aryan woman. Mm. Uh, so uh, so uh, women were supposed to stay home, and, and, uh, and this is because the patriarchal family resembles the fascist nation. Mm. Like, there are these organizations in society, like Hitler tells to jump ahead to chapter 10, which is about social Darwinism. Hitler tells, Hitler has a meeting with, the, with all these CEOs, the speech to the industrialists. And he says to them, look, your organizations run according to the leadership principle. You have a leader, and then everyone does what the leader says. You know, my organization for the government, you know, you, don't, you can't have such organizations in a democracy, because a democracy is one where everyone shares power. So you, if you're going to run private businesses, you need, a fa- you need a fascist state, and we'll prevent government regulation, you know, you'll have your domain, I'll have my domain. Similarly, the patriarchal family operates according to the leadership principle. The patriarchal family is one where uh, the father rule gets his authority from strength, from Mm -hmm. physical strength, and like the father of the nation gets their Mm -hmm. authority. Um, So, uh, so this is, this is, you know, this is a point that you know, so so to respond, so what I'm doing, so the patriarchal family, um, uh, private businesses that are structured with top down, uh, these are, you know, it, it becomes in, in, in fascist states, in, in fascist ways of thinking, these are the things that are prized. You know, uh, that's why when pe- I say, as I say in the book, when people say they want a CEO as president, they're mm. channeling their fascist inclinations. Anti-intellectualism. I have, well, talk to me about anti-intellectualism, particularly in the context of a fascist state. There are people who would argue that any sort of modern state almost demands, any any amalgamation of power demands a certain kind of anti-intellectualism. Right. So, I mean, anti-intellectualism here, so part of this was, part of this book, the different chapters emerged from my looking all over the world and seeing what's happening right now. So, Today, Hungary just announced that it was closing down all gender studies departments, and it was uh, it was eliminating uh, it was eliminating uh, gender studies. No one can get a gender studies degree in Hungary. Right. Central European University is a top gender studies department. Um, so, uh, European University of Saint Petersburg closed down because of gender studies. Um, Viktor Orban said today, uh, gender studies is an ideology, not a science. Uh, in the United States, what we have gender studies under attack. You know, you hear people saying, it's not real, it's really an ideology. Have you heard that? Well, that, I mean, uh, those echoes. So you have a certain common structure. Um, the governor of North Carolina, the Republican governor of North Carolina, Pat McCrory, said, and I think in 2013, uh, we're not going to have gender studies or Swahili <laughs> in cla- taught in our public universities. We're not going to have taxpayers pay for that, uh, you know. Uh, so, uh, so there's a certain structure to the attack, and in that chapter, I talk about that structure. Like the idea is, there's only one story that's told, and that's the story of the dominant perspective. And history, history, is the story of you know, the men of the chosen nation and their history. It's this that Du Bois is attacking in the final chapter of, of Black Reconstruction uh, when, when he, you know... Uh, so I'm defending the attack on anti-intellectualism. The anti-intellectualism chapter is, is an attack on multiple perspectives. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that attack on multiple perspectives is done as if multiple perspectives was a sort of anti-truth <laughs> view that, like, postmodernism. Right. But multiple perspectives is actually the opposite of that. Because the fact is, the same point in time in history is experienced by different groups in very different ways. And if you're saying there's just one way of presenting that point in time, 
your, as Du Bois says, transforming history into propaganda. So the anti-intellectualism chapter is the, about the attacks on universities that are done, often in the guise of attacking social justice you know, and for truth, but they're attacks on multiple perspectives. And, and they're attacks that are saying, no, you should only teach the dominant perspective. And that is an attack on, and don't be fooled, that's an attack on truth. I think about, I, I think about that in relation to uh, the culture wars of the 80s, though. Mm. Where you, yeah. where you had a very similar argument being offered for, for different reasons, to be sure. But the argument of George Will, uh, Dinesh D'Souza, uh, those <laughs> th- sort of kind of public voices were also engaged with academic <laughs> voices, the Skip Gates of the world. Right. Um, who, who, who would have argued? William Bennett. Oh my God, yeah. Bill yeah. Bennett was probably, you know, b- between him and uh, Hirsch. Right. You know, all these guys were having these conversations about... And then the end of history, the Lynn Cheney yes. piece, the end of history. Yes. The end of history was written in response to... So this is the final chapter of my last book, How Propaganda Works. Um, the end of history, so Lynn Cheney writes this... I mean, you know more about this than I do, but... Uh, she write there's a, a UCLA report I believe about how like you should teach like the Mexican American experience the you should teach you know the African Americans you should teach the different experiences that people had and she writes this piece the end of history as if that's the end of history right, 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 <laughs> and, right. and and it's an attack on the idea she's like you know no we should we should teach history as propaganda right, right. as the voices as it, you know we should teach it as a way of getting people to identify with you know capitalism to identify with you know the, the uh, Andrew Carnegie and uh, and you know yeah that was fought but these is these are old battles because they go back to your man Dewey yeah, and yeah. the social studies history wars in 1915 Dewey made a mistake there, took the wrong side. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's but, kind of his thing. <laughs> but, but, but but it seems to be that what's happening now is of a different sort. Is it? it or is it a more extreme version? And and I think that well that question yeah. which I guess we're gonna to have to get to now because right. I've been holding, I've been sitting on it for a really long time. Um is is that very thing. Are we experiencing a a a moment that is of a different sort or are we extreme are we experiencing um an extreme version of something that we've already been building toward. So I wrote this book a little bit as a trick to trick my fellow leftists who are all like, so leftists hate the crisis of democracy literature. So there's all these books coming out like, oh my God, oh my God. Right. See, the Madeleine Albright, yes. like guy has fallen, Madeleine Albright, fascism, this weird European view, uh, ideology has taken over America. And as if, you know, no, it, it, was situ- it, it wasn't situated here, but, this book is written as if people are going to go, oh, fascism, that's an Italian word, you know, he's arguing that, he's arguing it's a crisis of democracy book. But it, the book, as you know, is yeah. arguing that, you know, these elements, anti-intellectualism, like you just said, like what Mark did is he took my anti-intellectualism chapter where I'm talking about things for the last couple of years, attacks on universities, universities are bastions of leftism, you know, and he said, but wait, that was in the 80s, that was in the 60s, right. that was in the, it's, it's, it's not new. Uh, and and so, uh, so I think, so my reading is that what President Trump did, and I give him a lot of credit in the way that one gives tacticians credit, um, is, uh, is he took things that were already in our society and he just amped them up. Yeah. You know, like, we've heard exes are, are rapists. Right. right. <laughs> you know, right. Right. he just put Mexican there right. instead of, you know, so, you know, uh, so that's another chapter in the book is sexual anxiety. I mean, it's one of the most fascinating ones. This idea of sexualizing the threat. Yeah, which is universal. It's, it's universal. Oh, can, can you talk a little bit about that? And then I want to, we can circle back to this other thing. So, so, uh, so, um, I'm sorry, I've long wanted to talk to Mark, so. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to resist the urge of just talking to him. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. We're like, we're like having half conversations yet. So but is this, is this clear? Is this, okay. okay. So, um, and we'll do Q&A in a moment so you guys yeah. can jump back in. Yeah. And we'll, we'll have a conversation together. Uh, so, so let me read the chapters so you know, the, the chapter titles. Um, so, the mythic past, propaganda, anti-intellectual, unreality, that's about conspiracy theories, hierarchy, uh, the dominant group is on the top, and, and uh, equality is a myth, uh, victimhood, 
the dominant group is victimized by equality. Uh, fascist moments are always like yearn, you know, you always, in fact, like Hitler, Mein Kampf is all about the Germans have lost so much, they're totally oppressed, and, you know, you find this thing of, um, it's very men's rightsy. Um, so, uh, seven, law and order, uh, the, the out group are criminals. Eight, sexual anxiety, what crime do they do? Uh, uh, and uh, nine is Sodom and Gomorrah, they live in the cities, and, uh, Ten is Arbeit macht frei, which is on the gates of Auschwitz. Work shall make you free, and that's about social Darwinism. So, uh, so sexual anxiety. Um, so that was like there's a very particular structure. So the outgroup men are always threats. The in the outgroup women are completely invisible, or where they're visible, they're just prostitutes. Right. So we're familiar from black f feminism with this idea of the invisibility of black women and the hyper-visibility of black men. Yeah. Well, you look around the world at outgroups, I think that structure is universal. For instance, when I've talked to scholars of Nazi Germany and I ask them, what about Jewish women? Yeah. What did they say about Jewish women? They're like, oh, well, they never talk about them. Right. Right, right, <laughs> Except right. they're prostitutes. Right. <laughs> and, and so it's the same structure. Right, yeah. and, uh, and so black feminism is in fact a study of outgroup uh, uh, this structure and and uh, and I think patriarchy is the core because patriarchy is a relationship between the in-group men and the in-group women, yeah. and then the out-group men are are rape threats. So, you know, fascist societies, you know, there, there's always the first laws are always ban sexual relations between the in-group yeah. women and the out-group men. The Nuremberg Laws, <laughs> you know, they banned relations between Aryans and, and Jews. Uh, the, our anti-miscegenation laws upon which the Nuremberg Laws were based, same thing. Um, so uh, in India, I talk about the, uh, the Hindu love jihad, which was a panic in 2014 in India, where uh, they said the Muslims are trying to get Hindu women to fall in love with them and marry them and, con and then convert them to Islam. Uh, well. You know, so it's always that panic. And then what you get is you get people anxious about their patriarchal roles. Right. They can't protect their women. Um, from, uh, from, and fascism is a politics of purity. So you try to marshal these, the, the feeling of disgust. So the idea is the outgroup is going to like lead to impurity. And, then, and so there's just disgust at this. And then, of course, the attack on homosexuality, which is completely uniform. Um, because homosexuality is, uh, and it's always like gay men right. are the main threat. Like, no one is up in arms about trans men, or up in men are arms about trans women, because they, they threaten, uh, you know. Right. Particular conceptions of masculinity, particular exactly. constructions, yeah. Okay, so someone's going to say when they read this book, you've made a, pervasive, you made a persuasive argument. <clears throat> about how these fascist politics and tactics are growing and they're growing across a range of contexts and you've also given us some historical legs to stand on so we see how this is also situated within a long and deeper history but what do you say to the person who says you've made such a persuasive argument that you've convinced me that this is not a feature of the present moment but this is just how nation states work right Jim Sedanius kind of argument. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, so Sedanius is a, a psychologist, social psychologist who argues that uh, uh, social dominance theory, Felicia Pareto and Jim Sedanius, that all societies hi are hierarchical. You always need an out group. They, there are three hierarchies gender hierarchies, men over women, uh, age hierarchies, older people over younger people, and then arbitrary group hierarchy. Uh, you know, where there's some arbitrary group that always has to be on the bottom. And, uh, and uh, that would be depressing if so. Right. 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 And yeah, no, the thing about being the child of Holocaust survivors is you're not great at hope. Um, so, uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, you know, because, you know, and not being Israeli, I suppose they have a narrative, but, um, but it's not my narrative. Uh, so, uh, but I think that... Um, I, I think I, one thing I think you learn from the history of political philosophy 
is that there's always this struggle between these fascist elements, between power and truth. And, you know, and of course, if you look at societies all around the world, the vast majority of human beings have only ever lived under despotism. Right. And in the United States, you know, we have democratic vocabulary, but we've only been ever a very partial democracy, if at all. I mean, the Senate, obviously, obviously as we're learning, our institutions <laughs> are, are not democratic. Like, you know, it used to be very abstract. Oh, we have this, they're set up to protect, uh, you know, slavery and the power of whites. And now it's very concrete. Um, so, uh, so, so when you see that, uh, you see, okay, these fits and starts are meaningful. Uh, like if you look, and then you look and you realize like the role that anti-gay sentiment plays in, in fascism. And, and, you, and you see how generationally we've moved to, an, you know, young people today are much more accepting of right. gay rights. And I don't think you can actually have fascism that's not anti-gay. So, uh, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you you have obviously fascists who are gay. I mean, I could I could go through contemporary examples, right, right. Uh, but because <laughs> uh, 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 everybody under fascism wants to be uh, uh, white, as it were. Uh, you know, right. they, you know, so that's going to happen. So uh, so you know, that's why Martin Niemöller wrote that poem. First, they came for the uh, the so the communists, but I was not a communist, so I didn't say anything. Then they came for the Jews. Uh, you always don't want to not be in the targeted group, right. um, but uh, but uh, but you. But I mean, my basic point is like you. We have some kinds of um, change. We have societal change, and what we're seeing now is a backlash against that societal change. And we're seeing we're seeing that uh, you know we're seeing that if we did have democratic institutions, there'd be no hope. That the backlash would win, right. um, you know. So that should give us courage. One could leave this text uh, with the question. Well, two questions. One you so, sort of answered, which is the "is there no hope?" question. Right. I, I, I kind of want to push a little bit more on, on that. Um, but the second piece of it, and then maybe we'll go to you as now return, um, is, is and this is a question that. Most philosophers, the most academics hate answering, and philosophers I find really hate answering, which is, what do we do? Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We do hate that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so if you look at the history of political philosophy, what you would do is set up an education system, set up like a nonprofit education, uh, like what you're doing yeah. is what we do. We do local democratic activism. Mm. You know, you're doing, this is why it's so not such an honor to be in conversation with you. You're doing anti-fascist work. Uh, Titus Kafar, my, my friend, the artist in, in, in New Haven, uh, does anti-fascist work. He does, he does, fascism requires a myth mythological past. So what Kafar does is he does these oil paintings where he puts black figures into the oil paintings. Mm. So th it's like he's recreating a past for us that was more like the actual past. Right. So, uh, you know, we have, to, uh, we have to fight against the mythologizing. We do what Ida B. Wells did. I mean, we live in a country that's been fighting, I mean, black Americans have been fighting fascism for time immemorial, and they've been doing the work for time immemorial. Ida, what did Ida B. Wells uh, do when she was confronted with uh, the myth of what Angela Davis calls the myth of the black rapist? Ida B. Wells patiently went from newspaper to newspaper and documented how many reports of rapes there were and how many reports of lynchings there were. And then said, hey, there are way more lynchings than rapes. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, uh, Du Bois, study the Negro problems in response to um, Frederick Hoffman, uh, race traits of the American Negro, a story that Khalil Muhammad tells uh, powerfully in the condemnation of blackness. Uh, du Bois, uh, just patiently points out the statistical errors that he's uh, that 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 um, that he points out. He's like, no one is in any position to say that black Americans are going to die out, <laughs> given you know what we know about uh, social science. So you fight the fake news, uh, tooth and nail, and black Americans have been doing it, and they've been and they sh they've shown. Uh, 
in that the literature that black American philosophers and thinkers have created to fight fascism over the last 150 years is is just um, amazingly like a rent like the, the 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 literature in the mid 20th century is invaluable because it shows you some of the 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 for instance it shows you some of the methodology you need you need so what Du Bois points out is like okay I agree there are those levels of crime in this black population but you don't mention poverty <laughs> so you know we think of fake news as false but you can use true true truths and insi to insinuate false things about populations mm -hmm. so what frederick hoffman does in the race traits of the american negro is he produces these bad statistics these depressing statistics about black populations and says see they're all going to die out and then in the and then when he goes and talks about german americans and sees the same problems he's like oh look they have they're poor we need to get them jobs <laughs> so the selective use of statistics is uh so we have these weapons we have you know it turns out fighting mm -hmm. fake news is a long process it's complicated carter g woodson talks about this too yeah. in how med how you can how medical schools can convey false things by truths so uh so i think you know given that we're in a country with this long tradition of fighting this and given that as far as i can tell there are still a lot of black americans around we can't give up hope wow so sounds like black folk might save america again again <laughs> <laughs> it's always something to do um <laughs> there's a thing about um this past weekend um <coughs> polls came out kamala harris uh is polling surprisingly well uh, for oh, wow. as, as a hopeful, yeah, like she it was like uh, Biden, Bernie, Kamala Harris. Wow. Well, Elizabeth Warren has obviously taken a hit. Yes, <laughs> and this was even pre self inflicted. Oh my God, that's a whole other topic. Yeah, right. yeah, about, that's a whole yeah, other, yeah, a fascinating one. We can yeah, have. I mean, I love Elizabeth Warren. Yeah, but, but yeah, that was yeah, a yeah. bizarre response. Yeah. I mean, you, that's that shows you something on fascist tactics. Yes, it's really difficult to get in the ring with them. Like, you know, it's really depressing because you want to, you, it, this gets to the Holder versus Obama thing of, of going high and going low. Right. Uh, because I think that many Americans who nevertheless, um, like if it gets to like a vicious battle, yeah. then people are, you know, people are like, okay, I'll go with the people who are better at this. <laughs> better at being bad. Yeah. Better being bad, bad people, right? Right, exactly. But, but that, that's part of what I'm thinking about when I think about the Kamala Harris thing, because one of the things people are talking about right now is not whose values re reflect ours, but who can win. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It's, a very, it's a very pragmatic right. decision right. people are making. Under fascism is also this kind of populist impulse, right, that, that we keep returning to, right? We talk, we talk right. about authoritarianism, we've, but there's also this, this populist thing. Right. When we talk about solutions, I mean, you talk about the kind of local resistance. We talked about kind of fighting fake news, but is there a fighting fire with fire impulse that says that we need a populist counterweight to, to a Trump? Do we need a Do we need a Bernie Sanders? Do we need a, a, a new kind of model? Well, I think we need. You know, I I think like you famously said about the twenty sixteen elections about the left going back and having to to you know create a movement and really face. Uh, I think. We've seen our susceptibility to this. We've seen that the United States is deeply susceptible to fascism, so to fascist politics. So, uh, so we need to address those things. One thing I learned from the Hart book I'm reading, Bradley Hart book I'm reading, is that the National Socialists did the same thing that the Russians did. Hmm. They they attacked our fissures. They went after our. Uh, they they went after the things. They they didn't want. They just wanted Americans to fight each other. Um, so we have to deal with racism, to deal with patriarchy, deal with economic inequality, and that's what the literature on political philosophy will tell you. I mean, that's what Rousseau talks about with Absolutely. the more proper in Discourse on Inequality. He says you can't have democracy if you have all this resentment between people. <laughs> if you have like, you know, uh, so we have to, we have to have, I think, a left movement uh, to deal with those problems. On the other hand, in the short term, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you're going to have to have someone who 
I mean, Bannon said the other day, the time for non-entertainment figures running for office is over. Mm. <laughs> he says Oprah's going to have to run. Wow. <laughs> and That's why I'm asking. Yeah, it seems right. like we may be at that point. We may be at that point. I mean, there are certain features. I mean, uh, the president uh, employs certain features of a populist leader that I don't see someone on the left of being able to do. Uh, so uh, Arendt, in Chapter 11 of Origins of Totalitarianism, talks about... Um, talks about how the fascist leader is always vulgar. And the masses like that. They like the vulgarity of Hitler and they like the vulgarity of Mussolini because the, popul the way fascist populism works is they want, they, want to, they want the elite who they've been trained to hate to, to kneel down in front of someone they know the elite think is the vulgar. Yeah. So I think that we call that owning the libs now. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so the fascist popul po fascist populism works that way. It works with um, the, with someone who's vulgar. Adorno in the culture industry tells us the fascist leader is a little big man. What does he mean by that? He says it's someone who succeeded incredibly in some realm, like in politics, in fine, in money, in having money. Maybe they live in a gold apartment in the sky. Um, <laughs> But they're just like you, mm. and you know. And one time, Mr. Trump, uh, the president, many years ago, he used the phrase "poor white trash" in an interview, and someone said, "What do you mean?" And he said, "Someone just like me, but poor." Oh. Mm. Now I'm not seeing my side field. If there's left populism, it's not going to work like that. Right. So, so how is it going to work? Um, I mean, Kamala Harris is a prosecutor, so that's some. So she has sk skills, certain skills, right. and uh, um, uh, I think. But I think you'd need someone who can deal just tactically. You need someone, frankly, with Al Franken's skill in verbal <laughs> repartee, right. Right. <laughs> but who can, uh, who can, uh, you know? I'm sure they were scared of him, you know. Which is not to say that you know he should have stayed, but uh, but you know, someone who can be mocked. Right. On stage, <laughs> you know, and parry. Yes. yes. There's a God. There's a level of absurdity to that. Yeah. That's chilling because it's it, it's. I think you're right. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. he he mowed down 14 Republican. Uh, you know, just because they couldn't be mocked and respond, because that's you. You talked to me earlier today about television. Yeah. And as you said, you said, well, it's something you learn. Yeah. Well, it's something you learn to be like you know, mocked right. <laughs> in your face in a schoolyard and, and, and play to an audience. And, and the president is, is very skilled at that. And there's no sense that this is... I mean, because I think some people are thinking that we've reached such an absurd point that people will hearken for the good old days where politicians were just... Boring. Boring. Yeah. Boring um, white men. Right. Instead of, you know, yeah. So, you know, so, so that a statesman... Right. Maybe. May may maybe. I, I, I mean... Your, your guess is as good or probably better than mine, um, because I don't, you know, um, uh, or I think here we need a Tim Snyder, a historian, yeah, who can tell right. us what happens. Um, I've, had, I've had Eastern European friends point out to me that when your side starts fighting dirty, then it gets really weird. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I've had Eastern Europeans tell me that Eastern Europe's very helpful now because Eastern Europe is a hell of a model, right? Well, it's it's yeah, that's where we're. Uh, you know, I spoke in, I spoke uh, to in Ukraine recently uh, to a bunch of members of Parliament in their annual meeting, and uh, and they just know how this works in a way that that we're kind of like. Um, I remember hearing Eastern Europeans and like. Ten years ago or five years ago, talk about their politics, and I'd be like, oh, "That's ridiculous. I could do that here." <laughs> and now I go to Canada, and they're like, "No, well, you can't like openly lie. Nobody could." Um, yeah. You know, uh, we used to have plausible deniability. Yeah. Now we have what Tim Snyder calls implausible deniability. Because <laughs> right. uh, uh, the point is power, so you just simply lie, and then everyone's like, "Yeah, this, that's my lies." You know, the other side's going to lie too. So, right. so, you know. I'm inclined to think, you know, you, sh you can't do the tactics back. Um, 
So, uh, but but God knows. Yeah. Books that got that became extremely popular after Trump was like elected was um, "It Can't Happen Here" by Sinclair yeah. Lewis, and um, obviously for obvious reason because in America we flirted with fasc fascism, but we never we don't we never had it. But what I, I'm trying to understand why is it in certain places like in Brazil where they had it in, in very recent history, how it's making a comeback, and many, also in the Philippines, yeah. and because obviously. I mean, we're not talking about like the grandparent days. You're talking about 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Brazil is terrifying, and that's a uh, great question. Uh, I've been thinking about that. I've been very involved in Brazil. I, I had interviews with both O Globo and Folha de Sao Paulo the week before the first round, and and I've had to learn up very quickly. Um, my first interview, I didn't know much about Bolsonaro, and then. And the interview was published, and I didn't mention Bolsonaro at all, but it became like an incredibly widely read piece because it was very obvious I was talking about Bolsonaro when <laughs> so, I was describing fascism. Like I said at one point, you know, people say about Trump that, oh, well, he's not really a fascist because he doesn't openly attack democracy and openly say we want dictatorship, and he doesn't openly talk about extrajudicial kill killings of opponents, and he doesn't constantly talk about violence. Mm -hmm. And they were like, uh, <laughs> we get this. Because <laughs> uh, what you haven't, and then, and then I looked at all the comments on like the piece, on, on the two interviews I did, and the comments were like, you know, F democracy, you know, then let's get rid of democracy, democracy's corrupt, let's go back to the dictatorship, which you would not get here. And so just freelancing, being maybe a couple weeks ahead of you on this, or maybe being in the same point, my, my, my thinking about my interactions with Brazil is that there is some, the democratic vocabulary in the United States has more purchase here. Now the democratic vocabulary as Frederick Douglass, as we've known from Douglass and Delaney on down, uh, is hypocritical and, but at least people always, you know, you don't openly say, I hate liberty. <laughs> in the United States. What you say is, I want the liberty to enslave others. You don't say, I hate liberty. Uh, but in Brazil, they're just like, yeah, we hate liberty. So, you know, and then that tells you something. It tells you something that the vocabulary itself is important. The vocabulary, like, that's why Douglas is able to do the Watch the Slave is the 4th of July, because you've got the vocabulary. And if you lose, so, so there's a tendency, I think, to think the vocabulary is just empty and hypocritical, the way Delaney um, treats it uh, uh, in his 58 book, uh, but, uh, or Carl Schmitt for that matter. But actually, it seems to me that the vocab, just having a culture of respect for the vocabulary of liberty gives you a little bit of a weapon to then say, wait, you guys are being hypocritical. Whereas in Brazil, people are just like, no, no, we want to go back to the dictatorship. This democracy stuff sucks. Yeah, that's great. Hi, um, I have a couple questions that are related. So I'm a historian in training, and to hear you talk about fascism so compatiently, actually, wow. on one hand, makes yes, me really yeah. excited, right? Because I do like to play with temporality, but on the same time, I'm like, that's yeah. ahistorical, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm kind of wondering then, um, because I kind of want to un understand how are you kind of like understanding like fascist ideology? Because of course, as I've taken on fascism, uh, has we've, I've read works that's basically saying that specialist historians are kind of like the jury's out on whether or not it is ideology and whether it's just a movement. Um, even Mussolini's doctrine of fascism, it was kind of light on explanation. It was kind of more vague than anything. Yeah. And there was like this kind of move with both Mussolini and Hitler as far as like movement and um, kind of like aggression. Less about thinking and theorizing, more about just doing. Absolutely. So that's part of the anti-intellectualism chapter. Yes. Yeah. So I kind of want to understand then um, yeah. how are you kind of getting at this ideology? Because as from a historian standpoint and in my introduction to fascism, I was kind of thought that it's more of a movement, and when we try to get to ideology, it just becomes less understandable. And also, as far as historical specificity, um, thinking about the the context that Mussolini and Hitler rise out of, the great I mean, World War One did wreaked havoc on both Italy and Germany. I think Germany just 
finished paying the interest on their Versailles, on the, on their Vers uh, the Versailles, um, the money that they had to pay back to the Alliance. And now you're just picking on them. <laughs> no, 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 right? Because so, like there is like this notion that things are really shitty and really bad. And I don't think that when we're talking about the US and kind of like this fascist impulse, there isn't the same thing. And that kind of, as you were talking, it reminded me of Brittany Cooper's book, Eloquent Rage. She right. kind of talks about the notion that white fear is given more purchase right. and is more believed as like to be a fact. And so I'm kind of wondering then how does fear allow this notion of like the, this fascist, um, this fascist mm -hmm. tactics to gain purchase here? Like what's the specificity oh, here? Good. And also Wait, to hear on. you talk, oh, sorry. Uh, so what was the first point again? These uh, are all ridiculously good points. Okay, yeah, as far as like the ideology. Oh, the movement, okay, the movement, movement versus ideology. ideology. Movement versus ideology, good. Second point is conditions. His specific specificity of historical conditions. And Third motion. point, like, and motion. Oh, motion. They're like connected, fear, right? right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I kind of feel as if um, what, as far as I mean, quoted Mein Kampf, right? As far as like that notion that things are bad, and I'm not saying that like trying to give Hitler any sort of um, credit. Thank you, credit, because like no, I, I understand Hitler's bad, but when you're saying like Germany was like you know he was saying like everything's bad for Germans. They okay. kind of were. Like, inflation was horrible at that point. Inflation was horrible in the early 20s. Then, uh, then you had, I mean, we can get in detail, and you, but I don't want to get in detail with you, about uh, the... <laughs> oh, the, not your penis, uh, But, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, 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 inflation is bad in the early 20s, which leads to the rise of the Volkischer Partei, and, and, you know, Mein Kampf gets written around then. Uh, but... Then you have sort of a stabilization in the mid 1920s, the 19 late 19, 1920s, and like 28 to 31, you have another. You have the effects of the Great Depression. So you have hyperinflation in the early 20s. You have a stabilization. Then you have the effects of the Great Depression. So, uh, so which was which you could arguably result in fascist movements both in the United States and in Germany. Um, so, um, so, but anyway, yeah. So, uh, you, absolutely. Um, okay, a lot of great points. Um, let me let me start with the first one. Um, the first one is about movement, and this is the I take it. I mean, I hope this is what I was saying when I said fascism is an ideology of power. So what I mean is, it's not really an ideology. It's about taking and seizing power. And so that's why when I, when I say, people ask me, does Trump really believe these things? I say it doesn't matter because fascism is not about believing things. It's about seizing power. So I'm agreeing with you. That's, okay. that's why it's a set of tactics. So absolutely right. <laughs> uh, okay, phew. So, um, so that I think you're just absolutely right. And I talk in the anti-intellectualism chapter about exactly like, you know, the points you make are just dead on. Victor Klemper in Language of the Third Reich says, you know, fascist propaganda is all about moving people towards a goal. Uh, I say, and what I say is like the goals are different then and now. Like now the goal is like, like it's, then it was like to move people towards mobilization for war. Now it's almost to move people to demobilization, to not vote, to stay at home, to like not care. Uh, uh, so, um, so, so I agree with your description of fascism, and it's, and I guess that we're just differing over the use of the term ideology, and that, and that I'm saying that an ideology doesn't have to have a set of be a set of beliefs; it can be a practice, like Bourdieu might say. Okay, so um, in that sense, because it sounds as if almost um, kind of employing fascism as an analytic to understand power in the U.S. Right, and so it kind of almost seems as if it's like another theory of history. Oh, well, no, it's, 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 and uh, and and she was like, but if you're gonna say the Confederates are fascists, then I'm gonna. <laughs> uh, so uh, so uh, there are certain you don't really have 20th century fascism 
unless you can raise panic about communists and labor unions. Um, so, you know, you, although the Confederacy is an example here and has a lot of elements of fascism, you know, it's not like Confederates were worried about labor unions because there were no labor unions. Um, so, you know, the poem is first they came for the communists, then they came for the Jews, the minorities, then they came for the trade unionists. And, you know, that's like a uniform thing you see in anti-fascist literature. In Black Reconstruction, the story of Black Reconstruction is Reconstruction ends because of the emergence of a labor movement. Arendt is like, yeah, the labor movement is the arch enemy of the fascists because it's a, it organizes people around class, not racial identity. Uh, you know, the Niemöller poem tells us <laughs> that they came for the trade unionists. So uh, you need communism. You need to scare people into thinking that communism is a threat. So another difference is that, you know, although in the 20s they did... The, the 20s, what happened in the 20s in the United States with the Ku Klux Klan is very similar to what Trump was doing with crime in his campaign. There was no threat of communism and Marxism in the United States in the 1920s in the South. But they said, you know, there just weren't the numbers of, communi of Marxists or communists. I don't know. Maybe you, you probably know. But... Uh, but my sense is that it wasn't a serious threat. But the KKK, nevertheless, you know, there was a hysteria over, you know, communist-controlled labor unions. So modern-day fascism, 20th century fascism and 21st century fascism, requires panic over socialists and communists. And so that's something that, that uh, and we can, and what, what I think you, you, you see in U.S. history and learning from this, this heart book that I was reading on the train down, is that they were doing that in the 20s and 30s. They were creating total panic about communists. And they, there were polls showing that people were much more concerned about communism than fascism. Um, even though, you know, we've never been at a threat for communists take over the United States, whatever that would mean. Um, so, uh, so I think the conditions are very different, but the structure is very similar. Uh, and uh, uh, you can... As the president showed in his 2016 campaign, uh, you can just invent the facts. Or Nixon showed in 1968. I, I rely a lot on Elizabeth Hinton's work and the, the great work done by figures like Vashla Weaver um, and then Michelle Alexander about you know the the creation of mass incarceration. Nixon painted protests as riots. Then said there's a panic about, they created a panic about law and order, then went into office, and then created the conditions. He slashed social welfare, he slashed social programs so that crime did spike. Um, so uh, uh, Tim Snyder and I were in conversation on Wednesday, and Snyder made the point, so there's this point that fascists, <coughs> fascist politicians try to create the conditions that make their rhetoric more effective when they get into office, like mm -hmm. Nixon did with Mass. Um, mm -hmm. And Snyder said, like, look at climate change. How do you make a panic about refugees? <laughs> you make the climate worse, then the refugee problem will be worse, and then the politics will be even more effective. So, so yeah, so there were, yeah. So the white fear, the white fear that Brittany Cooper talks about, yeah, that, that can be marshaled to create a fictional threat. And, 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 you know, white supremacy in the United States means that fictional threat, we know that that means that, you know, you can easily make uh, uh, we white people terrified of, uh, you know, anyway, sorry, there's a million great points you raised and I don't know if I answered even some of them. You have these Massive social democratic and communist parties, you see. Well, those that, are very different. To social well, well, let me let me let me let me finish. And um, they they what they have to do in this situation is to transform the economy and to 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 to, to um, confiscate the big corporations and use the wealth in order to eliminate poverty to try and uh, make this their priority, make human needs the, pro the priority and not profits. That's number two. Because they didn't do that, 
Um, what the, the, the capitalists did is they gave massive funding to the fascists. And what the fascists did... Did you see that the Wall Street Journal just endorsed Bolsonaro? Let, let me finish. <laughs> what they did is they, they hired a civilian standing army. To give a, a, a sense of what that would mean, imagine a civilian paid standing army with the ideology of the Ku Klux Klan. We would have to have guards at the door trying to, to defend the place from having a meeting, you know, if in that context. So you have these three pillars, the, 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 the extreme depression, the failure to transform the economy, and the massive funding of fascists and complete abandonment of the, the power that happened before. And then Hitler, he wins election with the minority of the vote, and it takes him six years to eliminate, to demand absolute obedience without any, any divergence whatsoever. And once he gets that, and he doesn't get that just through government decree, he gets that because this is a mass movement of people who don't see any other way to advance. You see, the communists, they're not taking power. They're not transforming the economy. So they own, uh, there's a layer of people, mainly the middle class, not the workers, but the middle class, says that, okay, we're in this situation. We see no end game. And they went for uh, 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 Hitler. And with that, it took him six years, and he cuts wages in half. I, just only in the interest of time, if you have a question, I want to push you toward the question. I'm, 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 I'm almost done. Okay. I'm almost done. He cuts wages in half, and this is the, the essence of the fascist miracle, you see. It, it, uh, he reinvigorates the economy by cutting wages in half and sending Jews to concentration camp. So, just to conclude, it, it is possible to transform the economy. They've done it in Cuba. Not in uh, Russia or China, but they have done it. It is possible. And, and unless we do that, there will be depression. People will drive. This is, this is a repressive government, but it's not fascist, yeah. you see. Uh, 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 but that's where it's going to go under depression-like situations because unless capitalists are removed from power, uh, this is the way they're going to go. That's yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think we're that's on the same a good thing. We're on the same page. Um, yeah. yeah. Jess. Yeah, I don't know that my question necessarily deviates or it's just an addendum to um, some of the issues that the gentleman just posed. But um, I really appreciate you uh, acknowledging black feminism as a ground from which to think about uh, sort of global issues of oppression. Uh, as it relates to gender um, and sexuality. But I'm curious if you've thought about that same, um, that same genre, if you will, of that same genre of epistemologies on thinking about lo long-term and more widespread political solutions. Uh, because, you know, what I find really appreciative about that field is how, like, even in the context of something like the the rise of the laborer with uh, Du Bois's um, Black Reconstruction, who gets left out of the conversation of the laborer is uh, the in formerly enslaved Black female, right? And you still see um, in the context of, of their ways of being, prior to even having a discourse that we might call Black feminism, uh, ways of dealing with not being recognized in that capacity. And arguably, like some people would say, um, in many ways, these same ideas play out um, in terms of, let's say, like medical. Uh, medical re or black women's medical relationship or relationship to the medical field rather. So I'm wondering if you thought about 
how knowledge from that field might offer us larger political solutions because there is a way where the field doesn't get thought about in terms of politics in that way. It usually is only relegated to conversations about gender and sex, but also very much a gendered feel as only being for women, when in actuality, right, if we are talking about fascism and how it's hyper-patriarchal, then we must know that then something like black feminism that quite literally thinks about the absolute most marginalized is for everyone except for the very people that it gets projected onto the most. Yeah, I want to say I just agree with everything you said. And I don't, I mean, I, I, uh, black feminism, just like you saw at the beginning, I've come to think of that way in which black feminism structures things as giving you the general formula for what happens under fascism, that there's the invisible group, which are the women of the out group, there's a, who, who have at certain times a hyper visibility. Uh, Patricia L. Collins's discussion of the stereotypes facing, uh, like uh, the stereotype. I mean, uh, the uh, the stereo. I mean, the welfare queen. I mean, that existed about uh, Jews essentially. Banking was was considered to be a kind of welfare. Um, it, uh, so you get from black feminism. Uh, I mean. I get, uh, I mean, you, you get concepts that you can't theorize without, like intersectionality, uh, which is not having a concept of intersectionality. It, it's impossible to, uh, like, if, if, if you think about, when I'm trying to think about, like, how is it that poor whites get suckered by things? Like, intersectionality is key because they're poor, but they're also white. <laughs> and so like, like, you know, you couldn't, you could, you think about like one time I was in a debate with, with someone who was, who was like, well, maybe poor whites, poor white Americans, I was saying, well, dominant ideology explains why poor whites fought in Iraq. And the person was like, well, they're dominantly situated vis-a-vis -vis Muslims in Iraq. <laughs> so they might be, negatively situated vis-a-vis -vis other Americans. But mm. so, so there are these concepts, essential concepts, that you get from black feminism. Uh, also, teaching education, you know, to, uh, 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 when, when you think about like, uh, like forms of liberty that, and autonomy and resistance that, uh, that are there regardless of um, conditions. Uh, but, so, yeah, I mean, um, but, but it's also the case that Audre Lorde is hard. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's not written in a, in a way as, you know, I need, I need to rely on my black feminist philosopher friends who, who that's a very large, difficult literature that crosses, uh, and I would say this is true just of, in general, uh, I mean, it crosses performance studies, uh, like the Hansberry, uh, you know, um, uh, it, it crosses uh, what, way, what, uh, literature, uh, social history. So, uh, so it's difficult, you need an expert, and I'm no expert. So I, I, I have to rely on secondary literature and friends, generally. Um, because it, it, it resists discipline, it resists discipline, it resists being put into one discipline. And it has, of course, a critique of being put into one discipline. So, so, um, so it's a very, it's, I think it's an utterly essential way of thinking in particular about epistemology. I mean, I think one thing you get, Mark mentioned this when he's talking about philosophy. He's like, you get philosophy, he said, philosophers don't like making normative claims except for those experts on normativity ethicists. So what's essential in black feminism is you get the politicization of epistemology. Epistemology is something that's moral and political. When I grew up, like Kant destroyed that. Like in Kant's philosophy, you have the ethicists over here and you have the epistemologists and the metaphysicians over there. But black feminism attacks those compartmentalizations and says the epistemology, epistemology is political, look at education systems, look at like forms of knowing, like, you know, 
uh, to represent certain things as not genuine knowledge, that's political. And so, so you get this, and fascism, to fight fascism, you need to think like that. Because you cannot say to a fascist, Kant would disapprove of what you do. <laughs> that's going to have no effect. What you need to understand is the epistemology that limits things in the way that it does. And the epistemology of power. Uh, the way that knowledge, that epistemic systems are connected to power. And black feminism has been theorizing that forever. So as a non-expert in the field, as someone who relies on experts in the field, I would say in my year, that's what I draw on. It's that sort of like, don't silo off the areas, you know, ethics and po political philosophy, epistemology, they're all mixed together and it's especially this idea that epistemology is not political, that is most problematically political. I don't know if that responds to... Uh, you talked about the attack on intellectualism and uh, you also talk, said that it's a very hard question to ask academics what can we do. Mm. Um, are intellectuals and academics to blame for this? and? Do they have a responsibility of not warning us uh, on the rising fascism in terms of they're not getting political and if yes, how can we, what can we do to activate them and engage them? Oh. Well, I think change has to come from, it's not going to come from professors. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> I, if, it, if it does come from professors, we are really in trouble. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I have a feeling a lot of you are graduate students and professors. So, uh, but uh, but uh, uh, you know, I think it has to come from mass movements. On what, what, a friend of mine is Guatemalan, is uh, Guatemalan American, runs and uh, I don't want to say his name uh, or his organization, but he said, you know, in Guatemala we know that political change doesn't happen unless there are lots of dead bodies. So professors are not cool with that usually because we like Brie and stuff. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but um, you know, so, uh, but uh, do intellectuals, yeah, I mean intellectuals uh, under all of the, I mean, uh, it, I don't think there are that many times when when intellectuals in our position of being named chairs and at, at uh, you know, uh, uh, what's your chair called? What is my chair called? Uh, it's something. It's something very, very long. Yes, yeah, not very long. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, how often are we the source of change? Uh, yeah. Not often. Um, uh, but at least, you know, we're not going to be Martin Heidegger or Carl Schmitt right. or, or like the, uh, the, um, you know, and, 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 and we must have some power because in fascist moments they always purge the universities. So uh, in the United States, they went after academics repeatedly. So, I mean, they, I assume they know what they're doing. So we must have some power we don't <laughs> yes. know about. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I don't know. I mean, Angela Davis, Noam Chomsky, these are figures who did have political effect in our country. Yeah. Uh, and they, they, they are professors. Um, so one could argue that their most profound impacts are when they operate outside the boundaries of not just their discipline, but maybe right, like power academia itself. Right, right. Though maybe their safety, um, the, the, their status as intellectuals gave them a certain kind Fair of point. ability to speak. Right. That uh, and of course, I'm not seeing Angela Davis be Angela Davis without the black intellectual tradition and Marcuse as an advisor. So yeah, Marcuse uh, um, looms large there. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and Chomsky, but it's true that when Chomsky parachuted down and well, flew to La Laos during the illegal bombing right. and went from village to village, which right. <laughs> that, that was not in his, in his capacity as right. a linguist. Or Saeed throwing a rock is right. a literary theory. I mean, right. it's an interesting tension there. But right. right, Saeed, exactly. Yeah, so for example. Look, look, interesting, interesting, interesting people. Yeah. So I think you spoke about how fascism, uh, the tactics it uses in order to uh, convince the inner group, and I think it was covered before how um, intersectionality affects, you know, kind of like the the out group. Uh, I was just wondering whether there are tactics that are specific to the out group other than imprisonment that are used by fascism. Ah. Uh. There are tactics uh, directed at the outgroup. Yes. 
Um, well, yeah, well, but yeah, but you already know that mask, like what happened to the Rohingya, you know, I mean, I mean, this is hor horrific, but I mean, you already know about the terrible thing. So what exactly are you asking? Because if there are others other than, you know, like military action and imprisonment, something more like, more you know, like the past, yeah. More subtle. Interesting. Uh, interesting. So, um. So like non-repressive tactics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, repression by ideology. Right. That yeah, 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 thing. yeah. Right. Uh, right. Well, this gets to dominant, uh, dominant group ideology, and in this moment in time, you're not allowed politically to say that the oppressed group is accepts the ideology that oppresses them because you get kicked out of the conference or whatever. <laughs> and so no, I think that uh, that uh, so '90s feminism would say women accept the ideology that oppresses them, but nowadays you might say, no, it's only white women who accept the ideology that oppresses them, you, you know, because they're, they don't accept it, they're, they're gaining from patriarchy uh, because they're, they're one up on, uh, on non-whites. So, that's, that, that's, so there are various theoretical moves here. Um, and I think intersectionality tells you that, like, you know, white women, like, you see this in, in the history of black feminism, the point that that white women benefit from patriarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna Julia Cooper, you know, uh, is clearly like saying, we'll be better wives and mothers if you give us a liberal education. Uh, you know, we just want to be wives and mothers. We never get to be. Um, uh, Fanny, uh, uh, Fanny Barrier Williams talking about how, uh, you know, women have not even gotten, black women have not even been allowed to be in the patriarchy. So I think, um, so, uh, so yeah, that's just to say that, uh, that, uh, uh, right. So, so, so I'm not really sure. I'm kind, I'm kind of skeptical about um, dominant group ideology. I don't think any enslaved people ever accepted the ideology of slavery. I don't think any Jews in Auschwitz ever were like, oh, we really are lazy. Um, you know, that doesn't happen. Uh, Native Americans didn't, weren't like, oh, wow, we are, you know. Um, I mean, Du Bois and Souls and Booker T. Washington, they can get sort of weird in that point where they're like, because they're misinformed. They're right. Before, you know, before Du Bois learns otherwise, he thinks that Africans were living as savages and then brought to, oh, you know, right. yeah. so before yeah. Boas's 1906 lecture. Um, and maybe after at times, in other places, you read his... Um, it's another conversation, but if you read him talking about uh, Arabs in '48, he has his essay. Uh, oh, does he talk about Arabs? Yeah, he's happy to say that about, uh, about yeah. Muhammadism and right, and, right, and yeah, paganism. Yeah. And it's, and it's, uh, Boys could be painful. Yes, that way. yes. Right. It's called Jews and the Ethical Problem of Palestine. Oh wow! Yeah, I'll send it to you. Oh no! Yeah, he yeah, did. it's pretty. He it's did. Pretty, oh, he did. Oh, he did. There's, there's two essays on this. He always. He, he he also said that the Japanese invasion of Manchuria was like okay. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's a yeah. complicated figure. Right, right, anyway, right, yeah. another story for another right. time. But yeah. yeah, so 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 right. I think intersectionality is key to thinking thinking through this. Um, but I'm reluctant to go with the Althusserian. Um, I think when you I think the the. The kids are right that dominant ideology theory is deeply problematic, and intersectionality helps you think through that, I think. Absolutely. And our final question. Um, so I, we're all obviously here, like we're people who like to listen and exchange ideas, and I find that the supporters of our current president are not, like they, I, I feel like there's a lot of that, that, those points, like fake news, or it's this, or you're, um, you're a socialist, you're a communist, or whatever. Like that's right. what the response is. It, it doesn't really seem. Yeah, well this audience out. is. This audience, <laughs> yeah, the person behind you is like, no, we need communism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. 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 So I was, I was totally nervous coming to Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but I guess in reading the readings that I've been doing, because I'm, as all of us probably feel that this that fascism is coming, you know, and has been coming, um, but. I guess there's, I seem to notice that people who have lived through these times in the past, they're the people who were like, they somehow survived it, like probably your parents, or 
and there and there are people who are like, well, I thought Hitler wasn't wrong. You know, like there are people who just they probably go to their grave thinking that that there was nothing wrong with it. So do no, I've lived are, in Germany for years. Yeah, I mean, are people so? Is it just sort of a lost cause? Is it, is it kind of like a waste of time to talk to people in, in right. those terms? Like. Because well, I get the, that sense of exhaustion of, oh God, I can't even talk to this person because they, you know, like. Well, my, so my grandmother wrote this very powerful memoir, one of the first memoirs of the Holocaust, 1957, The Unforgotten. My grandmother went to Sachsenhausen, the concentration camp, hundreds of times dressed as a Nazi social worker to smuggle out 412 people out of Germany, which is kind of mind boggling to think about. And, uh, and her book, she talks about in 1936 going into the uh, Leitstelle, Gestapo Leitstelle and Alexanderplatz and uh, because a cousin of hers had been taken away and she didn't know what happened to him. So she just went in, which was not a sane thing to do. And she ran into, and she, she said, I knew I was going to be able to touch someone's heart there. And she went in and she ran into someone who she, she knew was now a Gestapo officer. And, uh, and she said, you know, I've done kind things for you. Uh, you know, and so he helped her. And he ended up, over a period of three years, you know, helping her. And when they were going to do a movie of her book, and she refused to allow, Michael Curtis, the Casablanca director, was going to be the director. And she refused to let them do it because, well, first they were going to have her fall in love with the Gestapo officer, but secondly, she said they uh, they uh, they represented Germans in a bad light. So that strikes me. That's you know, this is a woman who saw my grandmother, who I didn't get to know because she died of cancer a few months after I was born. But she saw the worst of what Germans, non-Jewish Germans, were capable of doing. But she never, ever gave up hope or gave up. Now, you know, my mother was like, yeah, she was nuts. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, and also German Jews felt very German and felt very... Um, so, so I think, like, even, even uh, you know, uh, or look at Germans, Germans themselves. I mean, I don't want to fall into this cliche of, oh, the Germans are wonderful and they're the greatest people on earth and have, like, totally forgiven them, forgiven all their sins, because I think that's a bit of hogwash and I've written about that. Um, but, uh, as my friend Dwayne Betts says, yeah, if you kill all black people in America, then they'll change all the street names and take the statues down, you know, so. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, so, uh, but still, I give the Germans credit and look at Germany. I mean, it did change in radical ways. And so, so when you see that, and you see the powerful testimony for me, this is just very personal, of my grandmother, um, you know, it makes me think that, uh, that um, it's a mistake, you know. Uh, people get seized by things. This kind of politics is weird. Like, fascists always, fa people practice, Practicing fa fascist politics always do much better than the polls suggest. So why is that? I think that there must be a lot of people who are voting for them just to see what happens. Um, mm. I don't know. That's a speculation. But you know, sometimes when my team is losing in 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 sports, I want them to really be crushed. I mean, maybe some people are just voting. Uh, maybe there are all kinds of reasons for voting for these characters. I mean, Bolsonaro did way better than his polls. Uh, you know, it, it's it's very mysterious. So, so now the core supporters. Can you reach the core supporters? Well, I'm probably skeptical about that. But I think there are in fascist politics gets a lot of people who support them who are not the core supporters, and that must be the case here. It must be the case in Brazil. So everyone, this says first of all. Thank you. Thank you. This Mark. has been an incredible conversation. And thank you all for making it so good.